And now it's time for our guest. And this is going to be a little strange. Our guest this week is Dr. Pamela Gay, my co-host from Astronomy Cast. Dr. Pamela Gay, welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout. Hello, everyone. It is such an honor to be on as a guest. I, I actually get to talk about my own stuff instead of other people's stuff. It's kind of awesome. Well, I think at this point, most people know a lot of the things you're involved in, your work with CosmoQuest, your work with Astronomy Cast, but you've got a specific project that's really cool that you want to talk about this week. What have you done? <laughs> it's not just me. It's an entire team of people spread out across a whole bunch of institutions. Let me just lay that out there, not just me. Uh, so over at CosmoQuest, we are always looking for new ways to solve problems with data so that the data can better be used to produce science. And one of the problems that we found out is out there is the astronauts, our beloved astronauts up there with their vantage point 250 miles up, do not consistently label their photographs. And, and these photos can be used to look at everything from when do the plants get uh, put into bloom, when does harvest occur, when is flooding, how do estuaries vary with tide. All this amazing earth science can be done if, if someone like everyone out there goes to our website, cosmoquest.org, and helps us label the photos. So what are they seeing when they're accessing these photos? We have a collection of 1.5 million everyday photos that were taken by the astronauts. And it's an amazing diversity because sometimes it's just the, oh, I'm going to take a picture of the Canada arm because it's doing something interesting. Sometimes it's this amazing picture of sunrise. Sometimes it's a picture of a comet rising up over the edge of the earth. And occasionally the astronauts got in for all of these really weird artsy photos. Very, very rarely, very rarely. They're up there doing their jobs. They don't have much free time. But sometimes you stumble across a photo that makes you wonder how bored was this astronaut because they're doing some sort of weird catching all of the internal reflections of this, that, and the other thing. And they're kind of awesome, but they still make you wonder. And I... I was just playing with the with image detective while uh, I was showing that on the on the screen. The podcast people will have to go to image uh, cosmoquest.org slash image detective. But I was uh, showing this on the screen. It is awesome. It is so much fun. And what's cool about this is as we get more and more photos that uh, we're asking people to label do you see agriculture? Do you see cities? Do you see lightning? Do you see cyclones? We're asking people to just tag a whole bunch of little check boxes. But beyond that, we're also asking people to try and locate the image centers on Google Maps. And as soon as we have enough images, which we're hoping will be in the next month or so, uh, we're going to release a catalog that will allow people to go in and search by all those little check boxes. And do their own school projects, do their own uh, illustration of their articles about Earth, do their own research and explore these images through a, a catalog that actually says this is an image of food. Because right now all you're going to know is this is where the space station was and this is when the picture was taken. That, that's all we know right now is when, where, and by where I mean what point above the Earth 250 miles up. And uh, that's about it. Right. So I'm going to be able to look through this. And I just I found some Caribbean island, I believe, and was able to identify that it had coastlines, that, it, that there was a city on it, that there was mountains, that there was ocean. And so in theory, then I could I could then search the entire astronaut database for images of islands, images of volcanoes, images of cities. And, and we let people also put in keywords that are the things that 
are rare enough that we didn't feel the need to put in little check boxes. And some of the things that I've randomly found going through testing our software, working on developing the project, is there are pictures of erupting volcanoes. There are pictures of last summer's forest fires in Canada, which were horrifying and amazing all at the same time. So we've captured all of these amazing things. Yesterday, I was looking at pictures of the Bahamas that are before it got ravaged by the hurricanes. And these are the kinds of images that, that will get used in all these before and after photos that we see in newspaper articles all the time. But right now, if a journal and journalist wants one of those photos, they have to literally go scrolling through all of these photos until they find something they like or go and use photos that come from one of the uh, global imaging spacecraft that's up there. Right. Uh, and so what is sort of the purpose, do you think, like, what is the point of of <laughs> everybody gathering together all these? I mean, I can understand from a purely aesthetic view, like, it's just amazing to look through all these images to be able to, for my purposes, if I want to show a picture of an asteroid from, from sorry, a volcano from space, something like that, then then I'll have a ready, handy way to browse through them. But but sort of from a scientific point of view, what are what is science going to be getting out of this work? It's it's that extra information on how is our planet changing. I, some of the things that I've found that are usable for science, and and I've only probably done a hundred images so far. I've been able to see the recession of glaciers down in Chile that uh, I could see change just between the images that were in Google Maps and the images captured by the astronauts. You can see how does the coastline vary between high tide and low tide with seasons. And, and so this really allows us to see how is our planet changing. And as we build up this picture, International Space Station crew after International Space Station crew, it starts to give us a big picture of, of not just the glaciers, not just all of these environmental things that we hear about all of the time, but we can also watch urban sprawl. We can also watch, well, what exactly are the effects on seeing all of these wind turbines going up across the countryside? we can start to see how we as humans are impacting the planet and how the planet itself is changing. My favorite photo so far is one of the California desert wildly in bloom last spring with all of the rains they got in California. And I guess I know that, you know, with the astronauts, they've be been getting a lot better with their photography over time. They're more and more professional photographers. I know the work that Chris Hadfield and um, Terry Verts, who just published a book of, of his photography from the space station, they have really good gear and a really good eye, good aesthetic eye, and they're, they're taking a well-composed photograph. And that, and yet they're taking 30,000 of them, 50,000 of them. Like they're just taking <laughs> a mind-bending number of photographs. And, and not labeling any of them. And they're not labeling any too many. They're, they're busy in space. They don't have time to, to be able to actually carefully label everything it is they're doing. So, so for humans to be able to look and do what humans do, right, is to aesthetically look at these pictures and get it and, and in addition, like really understand, you know, what's being, what's the art here? And this is the kind of data set that we don't fully know what science will be able to do with it until we've looked at all of the data. We don't know, do we have a thousand pictures of the Straits of Gibraltar taken over 10, 20 years? Or do we have one that was one moment in time that was captured? It's it's from going through, label everything, and being able to start to see where can we do these statistical analysis, what science is possible, which we can only do if, if everyone out there goes on and just enjoy some beautiful pictures. And and one of the great side effects of this is, is we make it easy for everyone to download their favorite images. And I know I keep changing my desktop yeah. background as I discover new and more, oh my gosh, look at that aurora, or wow, that lightning looks fabulous. I keep finding new and amazing things and uh, changing my screen backdrop. 
And so you said how many pictures there were? How many pictures are there in this in the collection right now? One and a half million. One. It's going to take a while. Are the pictures? I mean, still the astro there's astronauts up there right now taking pictures as quickly as they can. Are, yes. You know, are 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 is are is everyone going to be able to catch up to the work that's going on? I. It depends on how many people out there get involved. We have a few billion people on the planet. Oh, we are right. open to people anywhere in the globe. I, I kind of suspect that that only people with good eyesight and in certain age brackets really can do a successful job of this. But this is the kind of thing that if instead of playing Wells, Where's Waldo or one of those puzzle games where you're trying to find what changed between two images, if instead you get on your laptop and you do image detective, and I'm saying laptop because you need a lot of pixels to do this and they need to be big pixels to do this. Uh, get on your laptop and find yourself a new favorite corner of the planet Earth and enjoy exploring and know that you're enabling science. And you're our only hope of catching up with all of these astronauts. <laughs> I wonder if the, have you had any of the astronauts actually join in yet? Not yet. That, that's something we will be trying to do at some point in the future. Yeah, it's, that's, that's great. So what does the future look like for this? I mean, how long has this been operating now? We launched officially last Thursday. So, oh man, it'll be one week tomorrow. Uh, and right now we're in the process of working out uh, all the kinks, trying to figure out what can we do to make this easier for you. This is why we have a big beta label up there in case we suddenly realize, oh dear, we need to move this thing. So we've learned already that on the tiniest laptops, the start button falls off the bottom. So, so we're going to be doing just some basic uh, beauty enhancements, I guess. We're doing cosmetic surgery on our website to make sure the start button is always where you can reach it easily. Um, so we're in the process of, of making this work as beautifully as possible. And then the next big thing we're doing is building that catalog as soon as we have enough images to make it so that you can go in and find your next project, whether it be illustrating your great novel or a kid looking for a science fair project. All right, once again, where do people go to get involved? CosmoQuest.org slash Image Detective. Awesome. Thanks, Pamela. And we'll see you on Astronomy Cast in a couple of days. See you soon. All right. There. So that was the interview portion of this episode of the Weekly Space Hangout. So now we're going to move to the regular portion of the weekly space hangout i hope chad catches this little part here but Nino, we all clap Nino, Nino. <laughs> all right here we go hello and welcome to the weekly space hangout for wednesday october 4th 2017 i'm fraser kane publisher of universe today we've got some cool stories we're going to be talking about the uh what's happening with the james webb space telescope and you can just tell by my voice that it's not good news it's not happening <laughs> we're going to be talking about no it's not not happening um we're talking going to be talking about nobel prizes for everyone we're talking Definitely. about uh the spacex new plans for mars and what free on 40. all right joining us this week we've got our regular cast of space rogues i can't say rogues space cadets space cadets a <laughs> regular cast of space cadets uh first we've got dr paul matt sutter that's me we've got it's me it is i just uh and I, actually i was on your show today that was super fun thank you so much for calling up space radio and answering, asking me some really, really tough questions that were impossible to answer in the format of a radio show. Yeah, but that's exactly what I wanted you to do. Perfect. Uh, we've got um, Dr. Morgan Renberg. Hey, Fraser. Happy Wednesday. Happy Wednesday. Uh, actually, happy 60th anniversary of Sputnik. Yeah. I, okay, I can see Morgan doing the math in his mind right now. 
<laughs> carry the seven. Yeah. Well, and need to and Dr. This. Kimberly Cartier. Kimberly. Hello, Fraser. Good evening, everyone. It's Wednesday. So we had planned something at the beginning of the show, and I totally forgot to do it. So I'm going to do this again. Yeah. I'm not not that we're going to do the interview again, the whole intro, but you're going to actually like everyone. Just we're just going to keep this whole thing here. So. Joining us this week, the director of scientific presentation at the Fort Worth Museum of Science and History, Dr. Morgan Renberg. Hey, Fraser. Happy Wednesday. There we go. Uh, from the, uh, let's see, the Earth and Space Science reporter for EOS Magazine, Dr. Kimberly Cartier. Hello, Fraser. Good evening, everyone. It's Wednesday. And, and last but not least, um, astrophysicist at osu and host of ask a space band Dr. hey Paul M. Fraser. thanks for having me the osu the osu is it the you know what i'm a rebel you can just say osu i don't care the branding <laughs> officer is never gonna watch this i'm not gonna but it, could, but it could be any osu but you're at the osu there's like an oregon state there is an oregon state okay so you can either say the ohio state university yeah or or I'll change it for next week and you can yep. just say Ohio State. Ohio State astrophysicist. That feels like I represent the entire state of Ohio in astrophysics, <laughs> but it's allowed. The branding guidelines hey, say we're allowed right. to say it. Geologists you, get state geologists. Why can't we have state astrophysicists? You get I think your it's time. Title, I think it's time. You get your title to be whatever you want it to be. And I will read it. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. That's dangerous. Yeah, you should you should hear what Stay happens on a, you know on Astronomy Cast. Panel's got a very interesting and complicated title, and I'm happy to to deliver the whole thing every week. So whatever you guys want, however you want to be, feel free to play around with it. Take a couple of weeks, try on different titles, see what feels right. Just you wait until April first. <laughs> director of NASA and <laughs> director of <laughs> director of the thrilling space agency. All right. Uh, so before we get on to this week's show, I want to say a big thank you, as always, to our good friends at the Weekly Space Hangout crew. This is, of course, the producers of the Weekly Space Hangout. They are the suppliers of the fun chat that's happening down at the bottom. And if you want to be a part of this community, totally free, just go <coughs> to WSHcrew.space and you can join the community. So uh, go to and then they'll get you in on the chat. You can join all the behind the scenes. That's where we're all talking with the fans as well. So if you want to take your fandom of this show to the next level, join us on the WSH crew. And it's a way to sort of stay sane over those long summer breaks as well. All right. I have chosen to talk about the James Webb Space Telescope. Wah, wah, wah. Morgan Renberg, what's going on? Not as much as we would like. I think we all know that the James Webb Space Telescope has been in production now for quite a few years. It was originally supposed to launch, I think, all the way back in maybe 2014. And for those of you keeping score at home, it's not 2014 or 2015 or 2016. It is 2017. The James Webb Space Telescope is supposed to launch in 2018 except it's going to be 2019 for reals this time uh this often delayed telescope has Gosh. undergo uh undergone at least one more delay but fortunately it's not because any particular piece of the telescope isn't working and it's not because of the recent flooding in houston uh where the johnson space center is and that's where where james webb is uh, the telescope survived the flooding just fine it's just taking a little bit longer than they expected to put all the pieces together. Uh, the fancy term for this is integration. So all of the different instruments, the pieces of the mirror, yada, 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 all of those were built at different places uh, around the country in government labs, by universities. Then they all get shipped to one place, Johnson Space Center uh, down in Texas. And they basically bolt all of those pieces together with fancy space bolts and they do a bunch of testing on the spacecraft before they can launch it off. And it's that space bolting process that they think is going to take a little longer than they anticipated. So instead of launching in October of 2018, a year from uh, when we are now, they're now looking at sometime between March and June of 2019. 
So that puts it on sort of a, a five, six, eight month delay. Uh, and then it'll launch on top of an Ariane 5 rocket contributed by the European Space Agency. Maybe. Somebody jinxed it. Somebody like walked under a ladder while a black cat was walking past and broke a mirror while saying James Webb is going to launch soon five times fast. Just yeah, like, this is, it's a real problem. It. It's not just, it's not just, you know, disappointing and frustrating. It's also really expensive because every extra day that it doesn't launch, they have to pay the whole engineering staff that is designing and, and building the thing. And that is a cost that adds up to a lot of money. Uh, when 8. NASA had to delay six billion dollars so far. Yeah, when NASA had to delay its uh, InSight lander from when it was supposed to launch uh, last year in 2016 to 2018, it was thought that that delay could cost more than a hundred million dollars. Uh, and so, slipping by by six months, we're talking about tacking another. You know, it could be $25, $50 million onto, as Fraser said, this already more than $8 billion uh, mission, which was originally supposed to cost less than $2 billion when it launched uh, earlier in this decade. <laughs> Is there, does this delay, uh, the because there, there's a whole slate of missions lined up after James Webb, and I'm thinking specifically of the W first mission, mission, which is going to be the next big observer space based observatory. Does this push that back by six months? Probably not, because a telescope like W first is still basically in the design phase. They're not building things yet. They're engineers drawing diagrams uh, on pieces of paper. And probably different engineers are working on W first, then are working on James Webb. Or if they're the same engineers, most of the design for James Webb was finished many years ago. Uh, so I think the bigger lesson here is that whatever NASA says is the launch date for W first, you can probably add like, you know, five years uh, to that. And, th and uh, that'll that'll be when it more is more likely. Uh, more likely to launch. And that and that is going to be a chilling uh, sort of vision of the future for the last half of this episode that we're going to be talking about. Uh, well, so so I, I guess I'm curious and sort of concerned as to how uh, this delay in the James Webb launch date is going to play off uh, all of the scientific expectations we have of James Webb working in synergy with other science missions and how that will affect you know the the science goals of the mission and just we want to use it in concert with uh other things we already have or are soon to soon to launch and so i'm i'm concerned about the science goals if we yeah. do even that much certainly you know from the perspective of using it in concert with something like hubble you know hubble is downright geriatric at this point you know it's been in space now for 27 years and you know, tacking another six months, eight months onto that schedule, you know, we don't think anything's wrong with Hubble. But if you want to use Hubble to help ca calibrate James Webb, every day you wait is a day more likely that something on Hubble is ultimately going uh, to give out. And you can make that same argument uh, for any space telescope that's that's up there right now. So hopefully that won't happen. Number one. Right. Uh, but hopefully we are able to find the right combination of instruments uh, to help us do the science that James Webb is going to do when it finally launches, whether that's in 2019 or, say, in 2020. Right. But there are, you're absolutely right, Kimberly. There are even ground-based observatories and missions. Uh, and even though they're based on the ground, they still have expected lifetimes. They still have finite budgets. And uh, there are specifically missions, I'm thinking of the Epoch of Reionization Cosmic Dawn studies, the first galaxies uh, analysis that we're planning on working in concert with James Webb, where there'd be ground-based broad surveys with uh, pinpoint observations made by the James Webb. And we could end up in a situation where our ground-based observatories are done, their funding is wrapped up, they've archived all the data, they've published all their results before the James Webb even gets off the ground uh, if the delays continue. Uh, Johnny Zed's got a good question in the chat, which is, do they use these delays to upgrade any technology? Uh, which I think is, you know, it's a sort of great question. If, they've, if it's been 
X number of years longer than they were originally anticipating and new technology has come out. I mean, I know it's sort of a little more mayhem to try and jam that tech into it, but is there any... Abs- did- absolutely not. Absolutely <laughs> never. Uh, you know, we might all like we might all like to think that that's what would happen, but the kinds of things that go into building a, a flagship space telescope like James Webb are, you know, many of them are components NASA's been flying for many years. Uh, you know, the processor in your space telescope is not necessarily faster than the processor in your last space telescope uh, because we build these things, we test them. We know that they work, and the process to make sure another thing works is huge and uh, cumbersome. And so we could use the same CPU for a decade in telescope after telescope after telescope because it works. Yeah, that, that uh, all 386 of the design elements worked great for Cassini, and it'll work great for James Webb. Yeah, and, you know, the telescopes aren't doing, tr- you know, James Webb is going to be a, you know, a huge improvement on Hubble, but it's basic functions of, you know, turning on a camera, reading out a bunch of ones and zeros and writing those and sending them off to earth. You know, that hasn't fundamentally changed. It's not like, for example, what's happening on earth with something like the LSST, large synaptic sky design survey telescope, which is just fundamentally sort of reimagining how we do uh, astronomy. And that's, that's, need something vastly better. Uh, but you probably could basically run James Webb off of the Hubble processing unit if, if that's what you wanted to do. And there's no way that they would fiddle with a plan that's probably been in place for 15 years now uh, just because they have a few extra months. Hmm. Hmm. Do you think, place your bets. Is this our last delay or do you think there'll be another one? Yeah, there'll be another one. I am superstitious about these things, Fraser. Don't ask. <laughs> what? <laughs> superstitious. You're a scientist. Come on. You know, sometimes you just you gotta have a little faith. It'll happen when it happens, and it'll be great, and it'll launch, and it'll work perfectly. And we will find okay, we're not talking aliens. about a pregnancy. We're talking about the launch of a scientific instrument. It, it, it will happen when it's when it's on schedule. We can make it happen. We don't have to Project wait. managers are getting fired. My baby's going to launch just fine, Paul. I swear. All right. <laughs> All right. Let's move on. Uh, Kimberly, tell us yeah. about Freon 40 and how it is no longer a good biosignature. It was a good biosignature. It was a great biosignature. So Freon 40, which is also known as methyl chloride, is a very common uh, byproduct of chemical and biological processes on Earth. And until very recently, we had not detected it elsewhere in the solar system. And so uh, astrobiologists were very uh, hopeful that this Freon 40, if it was detected in the atmosphere of an extrasolar planet, that it could be a very clear indicator that there is some sort of uh, unnatural process going on and could be uh, a signal for life. Now, uh, in keeping with our series of disappointing stories, that is no longer the case. Uh, Astronomers have detected Freon 40 uh, in two different locations, in two very different locations, uh, occurring naturally There's life everywhere. It it's no, it's not. Oh. I very highly doubt that there is life on the surface of a young star just born. Life finds and, a way. And yeah. I very highly doubt that there is life far. that we've not detected in the atmosphere of the comet that Rosetta visited, which are the two places where we have now detected methyl chloride. Uh, so that's two independent discoveries of methyl chloride, one from ALMA, uh, looking at the atmosphere or the the environment around a very young star, and another set of measurements from Rosetta, which we're still analyzing all the data coming uh, that came from Rosetta, in the atmosphere of comet 67P. Uh, So what that means is that this methyl chloride is occurring naturally uh, in multiple places. It may have even been around at the start of our own solar system, and the fact that it's also a product of our industrial and chemical processes on Earth is sort of coincidental, and so we can't use it uh, as a as a potential biosignature, which is sort of a bummer because we're sort of running out of bi- potential biosignatures right. so, that right. we could look so for. Is, so obviously, atmospheric oxygen is is really great, 
Um, is the reason that there's interest for other possible biosignatures is because there's only a few limited uh, frequency bands where we can spot atmospheric oxygen? Somewhat, yeah. But uh, as we've been saying, we keep finding uh, new ways to observe atmospheres, new telescopes and new band passes that we can do this for. And crossing our fingers, eventually James Webb will happen and that'll expand things even further. But mostly we're just, we're struggling to find some sort of chemical or chemical element or a molecule or something that does not occur naturally somewhere. I mean, we can't use water as a biosignature. We can't use methane or CO2. We can't use can't really use molecular oxygen or nitrogen confidently. Uh, we can't use amino acids. I mean, the only thing we've found on Earth that we haven't found elsewhere is something like chlorophyll, but that's incredibly difficult to image even just looking at Earth, and it rarely, if ever, makes its way up into an atmosphere. So we're sort of struggling to find something, and we were... So are there ways, are there uh, non-biogenic ways to get molecular oxygen to the percent level in an atmosphere? Uh... You know, I'm actually not quite sure about that. Um, I know that there are periods on Earth where our oxygen levels spiked incredibly high, and times when it didn't. Uh, most of the times when it spiked pretty high, we thought it was a biological process. But we that's a very transient feature of our atmosphere. It doesn't always happen, and we can't bank on that, on us detecting that sort of signature elsewhere. But you don't necessarily know the amount of, say, oxygen that's in that atmosphere. You can detect the presence of it, but you really want to take your spacecraft and dip down into the into the atmosphere to really sample the percentages of things, right? Not really, no. Um, so isn't this going to be the story of every biosignature? <laughs> you know, maybe yeah. we haven't, yeah, maybe we haven't, maybe we don't know of a, a non-biogenic way to get molecular oxygen, but it's a big universe. And, yes. and so, you know, there could just be a planet that, you know, for some horrible reason just happened uh oh in morgan we lost morgan oh, oh no i think he oh. was going to say that there is uh some there may be some you know oddball planet that just happens to have this signature naturally but that's always the issue with looking for life on another planet is yeah. that if we just get rid of all the bo possible boundaries uh literally any place could have life but this uh, is like the core of what I yap on and on and on about on across all of my YouTube videos. So this is really important that I'm able to have some beach that I can, you know, I can make a stand on. That that as the James and James Webb is a great example, right? James Webb is coming is coming. It's going to be this telescope capable of directly observing the atmosphere of other planets. We look at enough of them, we should be able to say there's life on that one, but there's not life on this one, but there's life on that one. And and we're like literally running out of biosignatures now. Well, I think once we are capable of detecting atmospheres more easily, I mean, right now we, we spend months and months and months just looking at one. And we have, you know, a few dozen atmospheres that we've been able to measure in any sort of detail. But once we start building up this database of atmospheres that we're seeing, we can start to get a better idea of what is more common naturally, and we can start to pick out things that aren't so normal. And from that, we may be able to narrow down our choices somewhat. So get back to you when there are thousands, tens get of thousands. Get back to me when we wow. have the Kepler Space Telescope of exo exoplanet atmospheres. Yeah. Yeah, I think Fraser to, I mean, there's never going to be a silver bullet. Data are noisy and incomplete, but Bi individual biosignatures are never reliable. It won't be a statement, oh, there's life here. It will be a probabilistic argument uh, yeah. based on statistics that, uh, you know, there's a, a certain chance that life is on this planet given the data. Nancy asked a great question in the chat. She says, um, how do the prospects of exolife that is not carbon-based shift when we're looking for biomarkers just because life on Earth produces methane requires oxygen doesn't mean it's the same on an, any exoplanet. So, I mean, finding life as we don't understand it would generate entirely different biomarkers, right? Yeah, it would. But like I said, if you get rid of those 
boundaries, how will you know life when you see it? You have to have some definition of life that you compare to. And yeah. if it turns out that your definition and your expectations were wrong and you're proven wrong, then great. Light, the universe is more interesting and complex than we could ever have expected. But for this first detection, we sort of have to go and compare to what we know. Otherwise, we won't have any idea what we're looking at. Right. Yeah, we're not looking for life. We're looking for life that we can recognize. Yeah. Yeah. So keep looking. <laughs> well, Question mark. I've, I've got a lot riding on this, though. I just want to be clear. I, I bring this up a lot in the videos that I produce. In fact, I tell people we don't have to worry about the fact that we are communic that we are, you know, leaking out our electromagnetic radiation out into the universe because any alien with a technol with a good telescope already knows that we're here. So that, that this is like I said, I need to make sure that I've got some biomarkers. So I'm gonna go with molecular oxygen for now, but until then, yeah, yeah. Car pollution from cars. Come on. <laughs> All right, uh, Paul. Yeah, it's Nobel season. I did not. I did not win the Nobel Prize. Yesterday. What? I know. I was <laughs> again. I was. Me you know, I was looking up hotels in Stockholm. The whole deal. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I presume they book them for you. They come and put you somewhere swanky. Get your first class tickets. Maybe they uh, assume if they give you the prize money, you can book it yourself. That you can just book it yourself. You would think they put a little bit more into customer service for the winners. <laughs> like, you know, just that extra, the extra Nobel uh, shine. Well, if we know that you didn't win a Nobel Prize, who did? It was uh, three leaders of the LIGO collaboration. Uh, Kip Thorne, Barry Barish, and Ray Weiss. Um, three pioneers in the theoretical and experimental developments that led to LIGO and they've led personally led LIGO for decades. They got it off the ground, got it started. They've been supervising it ever since. And ever since the gravitational wave detection was announced a couple years ago, the entire community knew, you know, this is it. They're going to get a Nobel prize. The, you, you just can't ignore it. Uh, this is such a landmark discovery in terms of the dedication and effort and hard work of them and their team and what it means for the future of astronomy. So it, it was a given that they're getting it this year. Isn't this fast? Uh, it's fast, yes. It, it's fast in terms of uh, years since the detection. That tells you how solid their detection was. When they announced it, there was no question at all that they had found exactly what they were looking for, which is two colliding black holes. Uh, nobody in the community seriously doubted the validity of their results. And so it was a lock right away. Are, are, do you? Do I? Question the validity of the... Of of, of awarding the Nobel well? Prize? Is that the one, you know, when you're like, yep, that makes total sense? Yeah, no, they nailed it. They got it uh, and they deserve it. And that they, they're, they've they seen now three or four merging black holes and maybe uh, merging neutron stars. Uh, there was a rumor about it last month. And so we think the next announcement will be the official announcement of the detection of colliding neutron stars. Mm -hmm. uh, they got it. The data, is, the data are so good and their analysis is so robust. Uh, it's it's there, but it's a it's a tough thing to handle. I mean, you're right. I mean, the way you provided the intro here, you were saying like, you know, they are the these were the leaders. They're the ones who kept the 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 project going, pushed through all the stumbling blocks to get this thing happening. But there were a thousand people working, literally, literally a thousand people. You know, not who had sacrificed huge mm -hmm. chunks of their professional careers to get this project working both in terms of the apparatus and analyzing the science yeah it's and, and how and, it's and, and the leaders of ligo winning the nobel prize doesn't diminish or eliminate the contributions of the team members of ligo just like a director winning best director doesn't diminish all the amazing effort that and the perfection of the team that had to go into that it's about recognizing leaders and uh you know in this just modern state of physics nowadays that there aren't a lot of solo efforts yeah. they're not a lot of 
small partnership efforts. A lot of modern physics is done in these giant collaborations. The prize has to go to somebody. And, and we decided there, it's going to go to the leaders and the pioneers of these collaborations. The, the glue and the driver that's putting everything. I together. feel like it diminishes it a little bit. I do. I do feel like, I mean, I understand, yeah, they, I mean, you know, when I think black holes, I think Kip Thorne, uh, but, but still, it does feel a little bit like, like, it sort of sucks for all those people. And then the Nobel Prizes go to, think, to those three. You I, know? I think so. if I'm co-author number 857, because my last name begins with an S, uh, it, on the paper, and I join a project like LIGO that has been in existence since before I was even born. And I get my PhD and I'm a postdoc and I work for two years and I figure out some problem and I solve it and I get my name on the collaboration paper, I don't think I would deserve the Nobel Prize or even a fraction of the Nobel Prize. I was working for somebody else. I was working under somebody else's uh, supervision and direction and vision. Uh, Paul's absolutely right that these three guys totally deserve uh, to win the prize for what was an amazing uh, discovery. Uh, but I do wanna point out that this is the 54th consecutive year that the Nobel Prize was won solely by men. And it's, you know, it's just, and not only that, the chemistry prize was won by men, the medicine prize was won by men. And it's worth thinking about how much stock do we wanna put into the Nobel Prize as an institution when, you know, you can go 54 years uh, with such a pattern. It is. It, uh, you're absolutely right, Morgan. I think time will uh, work its pressure. Um, if you look at when these three guys got their PhDs, it's in the 60s. <laughs> they weren't born in the 60s. They got their PhDs in the 60s. Um, and Nobel Prizes, especially more modern ones, tend to go to older, more established people that are leading these gigantic efforts that take decades, that take years uh, to come to fruition. And the older generation of scientists are predominantly male. And obviously there, there have been some snubs. So like- you make a They got their PhDs in the 60s. Vera Rubin was doing her work in the 60s. I, I, I was just about to say that. I was just yeah. about to say that, that there are some notable snubs, uh, like exactly like Vera Rubin, uh, who probably should have gotten a prize. Um, and in, so there are some snubs. Um, I, think, I think give it another, say 10 years. All right. And, and if there aren't more women in 10 years, then we've got a serious problem with the Nobel institution. I, but it's no, it's I'll weird. Call you up. Yeah. It's, it's, right. it's just weird. Like some of the, there, there are some prizes for some things, not prizes for other things. I, I think it's time for a whole just revision, like, because it's, it's literally a, you know, everyone gets really excited about the Nobel prize, but it is this, these weird categories that were chosen by, by Nobel a hundred years ago. And there are new kinds of science now that even are being done. So I would be, you know, where's the Nobel Prize in computers, things like that. So also, where's the Nobel Prize in astronomy and decoupling the two? Sure. So all, all I'm saying is that I think, you know, I want to propose to the Nobel Committee that it's time for them to completely dismantle their organization, come up with something new that matches the the time and the scientific endeavors that we have that fully recognizes the Nobel both bound by the will of Alfred Nobel, right? You're legally bound to, to follow those rules. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. They don't get a choice. They don't get a choice. I know. Uh, I know. You know. We're stuck with that institution because that's the that's, way our laws work. That's what he wanted. Yeah. And, and so you can, you can make your own prize. The Fraser Kane Prize. The Fraser, prize, the Fraser Kane prize. There you go. Obscure fields well, of science. <laughs> yeah. I think one of the, one of the things. Large Fraser teams. Bringing up. Yeah. Uh, is that because of the the shift in science over the past few decades is I think physics gets lumped with so many other sciences that it's just impossible to recognize every single significant contribution or game-changing contribution that gets lumped in with the physics prize. Yeah. All right. Yeah. But, there, but besides, no, I mean, oh, we, can, we can stop talking about it. <laughs> no, it's good. No, excuse me, 54 years, but. Right. I, anyway, we should do a Kickstarter. I'm ready. I'll help organize it, and we'll start with a new list of scientific prizes that recognize large teams 
diverse science and, you know, recognize that there are more than one gender. Um, the, mil the, the, the money's optional, right? You don't and have the, to like match. Well, the no, system. I think the money is really important. The, the money really matters. <laughs> a big, a big prize is is. Good. And will you get a first class ticket to Vancouver? Yep. Oh, and, and yes. Yeah. Yeah. With um, all the prestige it comes with. <laughs> with all Maybe the prestige you just get an apartment yeah. in Vancouver. A no, Vancouver you can rent Island. A tux. Yeah. Do the Nobel Prize winners buy a tux, or do they just rent one on the spot? I think occasion. I think they're forced to use some of Alfred Nobel's old tuxes. Probably, yeah. And what if they don't well, fit? That's a that's like, a problem what? for all the copious a <laughs> number of women who win. I think. Yeah, no, that's they're why, they're wearing they only, they only Nobel the tux. tuxes too. All right, let's move on to my story of the week, uh, which is our good this week in Musk, our good friend Elon Musk, uh, hopefully friend of the show. Uh, announced in Australia on Friday that uh, he's revised everything with the interplanetary transport ship. There's a new rocket. It's called the BFR, big freaking rocket. <laughs> and the plan yes. is, man, it's crazy that all of the, the Falcon 9, the Falcon Heavy, even though the Falcon Heavy hasn't even launched it, it's retired. Falcon 9 is retired. They're only going with the BFR. It's a fully reusable rocket system the booster launches kind of like the falcon 9 the booster detaches the top part the spaceship part goes to orbit they can uh dock together transfer fuel the ship should be capable of going to the moon should be capable of going to mars doing a a powered landing on either the moon or mars and it's so cool it will be useful for doing point to point uh, suborbital trips here on Earth, potentially with the cost of tickets being as low as the the price of an economy airline ticket here on Earth. So, <laughs> so that is that is the plan, and that's it for the show. Thanks everyone for watching. I feel uh, like I'm getting over must. <laughs> You're getting over. All right, let's that's let's so let's weird. break this down here. So so I ha did have a chance to talk to a bunch of people, and. This is the conservative version of the idea. So what happened last, you know, last year, that was actually a bigger rocket. This new one is only 105 meters tall, um, smaller diameter. It's only a nine meter diameter, but it has that fully reusable capability, which is the... Um, which is the game changer if they can make it work. And they're so confident. They showed mock-ups of, the, uh, of the carbon fiber fuel tanks that they're using, showed the engine tests being done at 200 atmospheres. There's a, it's a, you know, it feels like it's a more refined idea on what happened last year. Now, here's the kicker. Here's the greatest part is that the plans for colonizing Mars are still go. They're going to send <laughs> two of the BFRs to Mars in 2022 to land on the surface of Mars and begin searching for Morgan, you be quiet <laughs> 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 to land on the surface of Mars to search for water, test out the techniques for developing fuel. Then 2024 humans, four BFRs are going to Mars and they're sending humans. All right, Morgan. Begin. Does anyone believe these timelines? Go for it, Morgan. Seven years. <laughs> So I think this was a really important presentation, uh, but not because of anything that Musk said is actually going to happen. Uh, the idea that you're going to have point to point transportation with rockets on Earth at the cost of an airline ticket is not even worth talking about. <laughs> you know, this might as well be the this week in silly things. Um, what's what's more important is is what Musk said relative to last year. Now, last year if not outright, the subtext was going to the moon is stupid. We're going to go straight to Mars because we're bigger and we're cooler. Uh, this year, that wasn't the case. He said, we're going to go to the moon. And that's more than just a change of mind. It's a change of strategy because for the, for decades, the rest of the aerospace industry has basically played the game of doing what NASA wants to do. They're going to contort themselves to present a face of exploration that looks coincidentally just like NASA's face of exploration does, because they're the customer. 
Uh, but under the Obama administration, there was no interest in going to the moon. There was always go to an asteroid or go straight to, to Mars. Uh, now that uh, the Trump administration is starting to put in place uh, some of their ideas, uh, the moon is front and center in that. And so it seems awfully coincidental to me that Musk started talking about going to the moon somewhere around January 2017. And now he has this presentation where there's a whole focus on going to the moon. And he scales back his plan from what he had last year. Uh, and I, I kind of agree with Paul in the sense that, you know, I think the world is getting a little over musked in terms of these sort of big, far out there uh, proclamations of, of plans, but he's moving in the right direction. Uh, last year's plan was, you know, ludicrous. Uh, and this year's plan is just sort of totally unrealistic. And that's a step in the right direction. And it, it shows that, you know, he's, he's thinking of the economics of the situation. And, you know, I will fly to Vancouver and knock on <laughs> your door your... if, uh, and receive a slap on the face wow. if in 2024, one BFR lifts off to go to Mars. Or even if the uh, BFR exists. Yeah. Uh, I love that Musk has these big plans. I'm excited to see that they're minutely more realistic than they were last year. And I look forward to next year's presentation uh, when we'll have a more reliable version of the Falcon 9. And we're all going to get to go to space uh, a lot cheaper than it is right is now. There oh, I'm, so, I'm sorry. I wasn't paying attention. I was watching uh, videos of Rockets Land. Okay. Oh, wow. Is there a risk that with constant hyperbolic statements and super aggressive timetables that have to be rolled back that the public and, and even worse, potentially investors might get sick of it and say, you can't deliver on your promises and uh, you're just a bunch of hot air? The Falcon Heavy was supposed to launch in 2015. Yeah. Uh, it's not 2015. The Falcon Heavy still hasn't launched, and he's already proposing the next generation of a rocket that's supposed to subsume the whole Falcon Heavy program. So are we supposed to imagine that he's going to actually carry that program forward? You know, if I'm somebody looking to launch a rocket, do I want to buy a ride on the Falcon Heavy two years from now? Uh, or, you know, why should I think that the Falcon Heavy program is going to be there two years from now? I, I think that his dreams are great, but, the you know, you're right. He's dangerously threatening his his core business with with his customers now yeah so so there's a couple of things that i think are important here the first thing is is that if he said that we're going to take 20 years to complete these goals we would be we would say that's fine like that's still pretty quick that that's great and so i think to say that they're going to take in this short time frame, it is more aggressive than is probably humanly possible and doesn't think through all of the details. And at the same time, though, that's the SpaceX way is that, or maybe it's the Musk way that they, they announce these, these accomplishments and or that these goals and then drive towards these goals as quickly as they can. And yeah, it took longer than expected to get the Falcon 9 flying. And yet, rockets land and they now have 16 they've had 16 successful landings reuse of 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 boosters which is unprecedented across the entire space industry that's never been done before and you know the plans with the bfr it won't even have landing legs it's going to land so carefully inside the launch gantry and just get clamped before it falls over sideways which is just mind-bending so i think that Getting to the point where, like, like I, you can just see SpaceX leveraging their successes. Their rockets land, they get refueled. That gives them room to say something else outrageous, what seems outrageous, and yet it does give them some cover to be able to move towards it in that direction. I think the biggest question right now is, Will they be able to pay for it? Will they be able to put in the time and money and investment to get this rocket to a point where it is capable of delivering on even just like supplying cargo to orbit for paying customers the way the Falcon 9 does? 
it's a you know it's one thing to to slowly bring on that other rocket line it's a completely other thing to to start to sunset as you mentioned morgan to start to sunset a product line at the same time that you're that you're planning to bring on this this new line this is a classic it's the you know it's fear uncertainty and doubt and it causes your potential customers to kind of go wait a minute i don't know what's going on right now so but i love the idea i hope it succeeds i really do yeah yeah and what do you think so cool yeah like i think that that's got to be the bottom line for all of us i mean kimberly you've been kind of quiet here but like, yeah, I'm would you the... like a nine meter exoplanet telescope? What kind of question is that? Of course I would. Are you trying to bribe us now? Yes. Are you... Which which can launch for the cost for of methane know. and oxygen, right? Like, I mean, yes, I would, and it's a great <laughs> dream. I'm. I think of this sort of like the breakthrough initiative. I ha I take a lot of parallels with the breakthrough Starshot program to what a lot of the things that Musk is talking about. And we talked a lot about the breakthrough initiative of we, of, you know, how ludicrous it is to expect these tiny little craft to make it all the way to Alpha Centauri, but wouldn't it be great if there were more closer to home applications of this technology? And so the part that I was really excited to see was more of the, can we do uh, quick and hopefully affordable transportation from one side of the globe to the other? And can we make that a reality uh, and sort of tighten up the corners of the world? That's the part that, of this announcement that I was most excited to see really were the things that are actually, you know, within reach and probably are of most concern to the everyday person. I mean, That's... going to Mars is great. Yeah. Going to the moon again is great. And everyone's excited and, and in, in awe and wonder of these sorts of things that we can do. But a lot of the things with space exploration that, the, the question comes up all the time. How does this affect my daily life? How does this make my life better? And this is one of the things that I think SpaceX can actually help with. And I think that'll be a really good point for them in the future. Well, there is another line. I mean, that there is another line that they're working on that I think could pay for the whole endeavor, which is this idea of space-based internet. They've got this these plans in with the Telecommunications Corporation of the U.S., whatever you guys call that there, FCC, um, that will launch 700 kilogram satellites and they'll put up 4,200 of them and they will provide broadband fiber optic speed Internet to everybody on Earth. Yeah, let's hear more about that. You know, that's that's an, a huge, amazing thing. Yeah, that's three times more communication satellites than exist. Yeah. from all countries on Earth right yeah. now. But I believe they could do it. Twelve you know, launches nothing, of the BFR. There's there's nothing standing in their way from making that happen. Let's hear more about that, and then let's hear about going to the moon, uh, because that's more exciting it's more fundable it has more applications and it's more practical yeah uh, that is and so that alone i think would fu easily fund it you know you just like sort of take over all of the telecommunications uh for the entire planet and and charge everyone a reasonable fee that would do the trick and there's nothing nefarious about any of this at all Nothing controlling all the communications, cheap access to space, biggest rocket that can go anywhere in the world in less than an hour. Nothing, nothing at all. Um, Not suspicious. Someone is cynical today. Mm, yeah, every day. So uh, Larry <laughs> Beckham just put a good Wednesday. point in the chat, right? Which is if the BFR does work, then the $2 billion a launch for SLS is over. I mean... What are the okay? Let's say that they, that they pull it off. Let's say that these things are launching. They are fully reusable. Sure, you know they have a couple of failures. Then they start to work, but and they cost the price of the fuel. What does that do to the space industry? It revolutionizes it. That that's everything that that we want. Uh, because you're right. Then you know we could put a nine meter exoplanet hunting telescope. Uh, up there, you think the actual cost of the rocket, uh, minuscule for a mission like this, most of it goes into 
the uh, instrument itself and then all the personnel that have to design and implement. Well, it depends on the, it depends on the size of the, the mission. So let's take a, like a discovery class mission. So these are NASA missions that are like $500 million. Uh, you know, those usually last launch on Atlas V rockets, which mm -hmm. cost in the neighborhood of $250 million, maybe $200 million. Uh, so that, you know, basically for every discovery mission you launch, uh, with Atlas V, if you launch that on a reusable platform, you could launch one and a half. That's a meaningful, substantial increase right. in, yeah. in the ones. Instead of every three years, it's every other year. That's a big deal. And you might even be willing to take more risks and experiment with a cooler, cooler mission if you, didn't, if you didn't have to pay an extra $250 million to make it happen. I it see. definitely is less when you're getting up to the James Webb class of things. Uh, but for this, it enables those small things to happen. Yeah. So, so I guess the the bottom line is that if if this happens, if this works, if he's right, then literally the entire space industry is completely revolutionized. All existing launch company companies that exist right now are meaningless in comparison. And what can be done? both in terms of just like launching things into space and what can be, you know, asteroid mining, uh, uh, transportation, space tourism. And then if, you know, point to point transportation is a whole separate thing, telecommunication satellites, scientific satellites, everything changes, but it is a tall order. This has never been done before to this extent. And to come in that aggressive of timeline is just mind bending. So, We'll just have to keep watching and see what happens, and we'll keep you all posted as it all as it all comes together, without <laughs> or, getting over musked. We're we're that's, we've got the cool. we got the musk. Yeah, we got the. That's, that's, that's the, a lot of musk. Yeah, the musk is everywhere. There's no getting away from it Thanks now. Thanks for that. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So now we're gonna break for our interview. Now the interview's done, and <laughs> we are going to wrap things up. Now, podcast listeners, uh, people watching us live, we would like to pick your brains here. What can we do to wrap up the show? There's a lot of other podcasts out there. They have some kind of clever way that they end the show. Maybe talk about something they're skeptical about. We could talk about slugs, as uh, happened in a previous uh, episode. There were snails. They were snails. No, snails, not slugs. That's right. Yeah, we could talk about, right, there's a big difference. Um, we could talk about uh, some other science that we're excited about, something quick, some way to, or something completely off topic. So uh, if you're listening to this show, go ahead, send an email. We don't actually even have an email. Send me an email, and then I'll distribute them to everybody else. Either come on to the Slack for the WSH crew or send me an email at my name, Fraser Kane at gmail.com. And I will, I will forward the ideas along to the rest of the co-hosts until we have a shared email address. Until then, um, uh, Kimberly, Why? what's yes. something that's going on? Where can people find out more? So people can always find out more by following me on Twitter on the Twitters. Uh, at Astro Kim Cartier and my website, KimberlyCartier.org. And uh, of course, I work at EOS Magazine. Um, we have a website, EOS.org, where I write regularly about Earth and space science. So definitely check that out. What, uh, uh, what, what's your most recent article? Uh, the most recent article I wrote about was about the increase in nuisance flooding along the U.S. East Coast because we've been playing around with groundwater a lot. Very cool. Basically, dams and groundwater make things flood, and that is sad. But it's been happening for a while, so. Paul you know. Sutter, where do people find out more? Yeah, not as sad as flooding the East Coast. No. Wow. Yeah, man. <sighs> Everywhere is flooding. Yeah, everywhere is flooding. Yeah, you can, it's uh, a bummer episode. What can I say? It's just someone got no way. We, but apparently, nobody else I, cares except for me. <laughs> Well, okay, I'll tell you what. I woke up. I woke up at five thirty in the morning to watch the live announcement for this Gen Nobel Prize. Yeah, and it was gravitational waves, and I was like, "Well, duh." Why did I wake up at five thirty in the morning to hear this? Of course, gravitational waves, and then I went back to sleep. Of course, it's gravitational. 
Paul uh, Matt Sutter. On the show. He's totally available now. <laughs> where, where, tell me something cool that you just worked on, a new project. Shamelessly self promote something that you're doing. Yeah, Space Radio. It's my radio show here in Columbus, but it also uh, broadcasts across the world via podcast. It's already started. It's been a month going. You came on the show today. Thank you very much for accepting my invitation. Asked me some very difficult questions, which was super fun. That episode will air next week. And uh, yeah, spaceradioshow.com. Right on. It's, fun. it's a good show. It's fun. Follow him on Twitter, Paul Matt Sutter. At Paul Matt Sutter. That's right. Morgan. Well, if you want a, a much, much less jaded view of uh, Elon Musk's announcement, uh, you can check out the video I wrote for SciShare Space. This uh, should be uh, coming out this Friday, break down all of the uh, plans in, in some more detail. Uh, otherwise, you can check out my website, morganrenberg.com. Awesome. And uh, my video on this subject is actually going to be coming out Probably tomorrow, so it's no. in it's in editing right now. So it's a race, Morgan. Uh, maybe it'll come out on Friday, but uh, depends on on how hard Chad works tonight editing. But uh, I'll but, buy you a beer, Chad. <laughs> but uh, you should totally check out. I don't know if I mentioned this. Uh, it's Aurora season, man. I've been having so much fun. No, I I have a friend in Iceland right now, and he's seen them every single night. Every single night. Yeah, and of course we're going to be going to Iceland in February to see them. So that's right. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, thanks everyone for watching. Thanks as always to our co-host. Thanks to uh, Dr. Pamela Gay for being our special guest this week. Go to Image Detectives. There'll be links and show notes and stuff. Um, we'll see you all next week. Bye. Bye everybody. Have a good weekend.